Hello, Moto America fans. It's time for another episode of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you may even learn something from this unlikely pair and their special guest. The mic is yours, Paul and Sean. Well, good afternoon, evening, morning, whatever it is for our, our Moto America fans and listeners to the Off Track podcast with Carruthers and Vice. Uh, we do this podcast every week where we talk about Moto America and basically all things road racing uh, worldwide, mostly Moto America because they're the ones that pay our bills. But I'm joined as always by uh, by Sean Vice. He's out in Ohio. I'm in Southern California. So we're a little bit separated by miles, but uh, our hearts beat together, right, Sean? They really do, especially now, because I know we kind of always touch on weather, but hey, spring has sprung here, Paul. I mean, we've got sunny weather. It's not quite Southern California, but I'll take it. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah, and we were just discussing the time change, which I always yep. like it. It allows me to uh, to get my bike ride in, in the afternoon, if that's an option, rather than running out of daylight, you know, so it's... Uh, that that helps me a lot and I don't know it just makes it start to feel like summer so it's cool yeah it's really good hey Paul you know you were saying that like you have to be careful in the bike lane because of a certain uh, guy on a Ducati that runs around there a little bit uh do you ever see Josh Heron after dark riding around on that Ducati or <laughs> no I've only seen I've only seen his videos but it's funny because the one video I was watching and he was doing a stand-up wheelie I'm like that's literally a half a mile from my house and <laughs> And it's, and it's a bike lane I ride in. So I wasn't real happy with him, but he, he <laughs> doesn't care. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's St. Patrick's Day. It won't be St. Patrick's Day when the people are listening to this, but it's St. Patrick's Day when we're recording it. And uh, it, that's, it's kind of cool. We're going to be talking to Jeremy McWilliams. And I can tell you a little bit about Jeremy. I'm not going to tell you everything because we'd be here all day. But he's a, he's a road racer, obviously. Uh, he's got two podiums in 500 cc gps he's won a 250 grand prix he rode for kenny roberts he earned pole position at phillip island on kenny's bike in 2002 he's raced british superbike he's raced an aprilia in moto gp he's done very well at the northwest 200 which is a, a a world famous street race um there in northern ireland uh he's been in a movie with scarlett johansson uh, yeah he's served as a KTM development rider for what seems like an eternity, but I don't know how, how actually long that is. And now, lo and behold, he's a King of the Baggers, Moto America King of the Baggers winner at Daytona last weekend. And I, I knew Jeremy was popular. Uh, and he's been around a long time, obviously, because he's almost as old as us, Sean. Yep. But his, his popularity actually surprised me. It's he, he's very big on Twitter, which is, it's kind of my social media platform of choice because it's, it's kind of newsy and, and, and stuff like that instead of just, you know, pretty pictures and what people had for dinner. And I did a video, I did a little video of him on the walking up to the podium. He did a little dance after he won the race and we got over a hundred thousand views on that. Now I checked, you know, I thought the announcement when uh, when Petrucci was announced that he was going to come here was big, and 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 Jeremy surpassed that. So it's it's very cool to have him on the show today, and and welcome Jeremy, and again congratulations for what you were able to accomplish at Daytona. And my opening question to you is, was it did it surprise you with how popular that was and how much recognition that brought you? You know, basically worldwide. Yeah. Hi. And thanks for having me guys on the show, by the way. Um, pleasure to be here. Yeah, I, it did a little bit. I was a bit shocked because, you know, you don't really know what to expect on, on social media. It's quite different from when I was winning GPs. You know, I, I remember I won a 250 GP in Assen and kind of had to go and hide for a couple of days in, in Bournemouth out of the way and turn my phone off because, you know, it went pretty crazy back then. But the power of social media is 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 quite incredible. It's and it's taken me aback. You know, I I think one tweet I, I've looked at it and I checked my tweet or the view the activity on it and it was it surpassed three hundred thousand now. Probably that that one you're talking about when I retweeted it. So, I mean, it's been it's been a bit crazy because you know you don't really expect to come home from winning 
you know, a King of the Baggers race and then have to go into, you know, one interview after another. I've had to do some TV stuff over here, uh, a couple of blogs, a couple of interviews, which, uh, by the way, I don't mind whatsoever. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy to be doing it because it's, it's getting all of our sponsors I mentioned as well and, and keeping us at the, at the front of, you know, the, of the popularity stakes, hopefully. Hello? Sorry, Jer sorry, Jeremy. That was that was my that was my phone that I forgot to do. Do not disturb on for the hour. I apologize. He does this all the time, Jeremy. <laughs> you know, he messes everything up for us, and we just put up with it because we love him. Yeah, it, all it, right. It, Mine it, might it, do that too. Micro, it didn't mean my microwave popcorn was done, and I'm ready to eat it. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I <laughs> wonder what it was. <laughs> sorry. Hey, so let, let me let me move on. First of all, a couple of things from me, being that I'm Sean and, and you know, you know, I'm Irish as well. So we're outnumbering that Australian Paul Carruthers right now. So, so glad to have you on on St. Patrick's Day. Jeremy, are you like me on St. Patrick's Day because I am Irish? I don't wear green. I actually make sure that I don't wear green because I have green in my heart. How do you, do you wear green on St. Patrick's Day or are you the same way? No, we kind of, we don't really get that excited about St. Patrick's Day any longer. I mean, it's, it, it, it kind of surprises me. Uh, makes me smile when I see how, you know, it gets, uh, it, it's, it's so popular worldwide, you know, particularly in parts of America. We're just carrying on as a, as a normal day here in Ireland at the minute. Yeah, I know there'll be some uh, festivals and stuff going on down in Dublin Centre, you know, marches and things, but um, kind of stay out of the way of it because it's not the day that, that any uh, certainly I don't go out into the pub and and, and go on the lash because it's St. Paddy's Day. <laughs> Save that for the other six days of the week. Yeah, Friday's good for that. This is Thursday, right? <laughs> yeah. Until tomorrow night. <laughs> you know, and and just to get a couple of these things out of the way, I mean, I know there are a few people in in racing that refer to themselves as Ulsterman, and you are a true Ulsterman. Can you can you explain for our listeners what being an Ulsterman means? Well, I live in Ulster, so the north of Ireland is it, 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 that province is is called Ulster. You know, it's six counties, and it's you know we're we're actually. It, it, I mean, I could probably go on for an hour about the 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 the, the whole of Ireland because you know you've got the north and the south, and we're living in the north. It's part of the UK still, so the United Kingdom, and of course, uh, Southern Ireland is is a republic. It's it's Ireland itself, so. When you explain to Americans, what the, you know, or anybody actually Australians or anybody around the world, it's it gets it sounds a little bit complicated. But let's just keep it simple. That uh, yeah, I live in the north, so uh, that's how that's that's how you get the name of an Ulster man. And uh, but you know, we 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 don't have any divides any any longer. It's been a there's, a, there's been many many years of 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 bad reputations about you know you know how the north and the south don't get on. But thankfully. All of that has been brushed aside and it's it's a lovely, peaceful island and everybody loves each other. Let's pretend. That's actually really good to hear, <laughs> Jeremy. I wonder, because I, I think I might be from Southern. You can tell me this. I always get this mixed up. I am Protestant by by birth um, in my family. Is that pr mm -hmm. primarily more Southern Ireland than it is Ulster? Northern? No, no, it's, it's actually more Northern Ireland. I always get it backwards. Okay, so I might be, I might be an Ulsterman too. Then, all right. Yeah, you told you probably Something. are. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a story. I uh, I have vivid memories of Ireland as a kid because we happened to my father won the um, Ulster Grand Prix in 1969 and 1970, and oh. Sean, that was a, an incredible time to be in that yeah. area because I mean I remember as a kid you know I was, I was nine ten years old and uh you know that the cars were flipped upside down in the street there were you know uh, military with machine guns and <laughs> it was it, it, there was bombs going off in the night I mean think about this when you're nine or ten years old it was yeah. pretty, pretty daunting <laughs> but amazingly enough the, the race went on and and it's funny because um, that's, you know, my dad loved the TT or loves the TT, obviously, but he would tell you that the Ulster Grand Prix at Dundrod was his, his favorite Grand Prix to, to race in. And he obviously did well there, but 
So that's my Irish Irish story, even though uh, Carruthers and my mom's maiden name is McFadden. Both, I think, are Scottish, but that's my, <laughs> right, right. That's my ties to Ireland, and it's, it's something I'll never forget because it was, uh, like I said, it was pretty dramatic stuff. Yeah, I, I remember all that. I came up through that. I, I lived just on the outskirts of Belfast, so I, I saw all, all of those, the, wow. the, those ba the bad old days. Um, as I said, thankfully, all that's that, all that's long past. Um, I, I live quite close to the Ulster Grand Prix track. Actually, uh, I cycle around it quite regularly. Uh, it's only about uh, yeah. I, I can. I'm looking out the window actually, and I can really. I'm looking towards Dundrod, which is right over the hill from me, um, wow. and it's you know it's quite a, quite close proximity. So I spent a lot of time there watching racing as I was growing up. Also, before I even had any intention of racing, and and the Northwest 200, never right. thinking I would get a chance ever to ride at the Northwest 200. I haven't done the Ulster Grand Prix, but I've raced the uh, Northwest about six or seven times, one or three times on a super twin. And I've raced at the Armoy road races, which is up that area as well. And I did one time I raced a, a road race called Tandra Gee. So, but that's, that all happened after I'd finished my, you know, my, my career in, in GPs and stuff. So it was just an opportunity came along and I, and I jumped out of, and I, I, tend, I really love the Northwest 200. It's a great place to, to be probably 200, 250,000 people visit over the week. So it's a, it's a lovely place to be, lovely atmosphere and great part of the world. Now, is that race on again this year or is it still off? Yeah, it's on. It's coming okay, on in May. Good. Yeah, it's, it's uh, second week of May. So it's a okay. cool week. It's nice the way it happens because you know you, you you come and sign on the Monday, practice Tuesday, take a day off on Wednesday, go and play golf. Thursday you come back, do some more qualifying, and then you race in the evening, take the Friday off, and then we race Saturday. So it's a it's a nice way to to spend the whole week. Yeah, it sounds like it. All right, well let's jump forward to uh, to last week. You you showed up at Daytona. We we knew you were going to be fast. You'd had. I believe just one test on the bike on the Indian. You 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 qualified well. Race one went pretty well, and then you won race two. Did that surprise you, or did you think that that was going to happen? Uh, I, you know, I think when you take on these uh, opportunities, it, you you always believe you're going to do well. You, you, there's no point in you coming over and thinking that you're not going to be competitive, or I just wouldn't do it. Um, you know, without signing like, you know, that, 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 that sounds a bit contrived, but yeah, you do believe that you're going to come over and be able to compete and hopefully pull something out of the bag. That's really what, you know, I, well, I went and my son was laughing at me. He said, well, you gone and ran around the mountain twice before you went over to Daytona. That's not really, I haven't really trained much. And I said, yeah, but I've been riding bikes and I've been, you know, I've been keeping myself relatively, uh, fit as I always do. But the reason for, for going and running, like doing a solo, like a long solo run, is, is to kind of convince yourself that you're doing the right thing. It's more, of, it's more mentally preparing yourself than it is anything else. So, I, yeah, I went over thinking, I want to get a podium here on the first, certainly on the first day, and then try to work on it from there. And I missed out on the podium, so I was a bit, I was a bit annoyed at myself on the, on the Friday. And I, um, I kind of went and looked at the, at the data and looked at, at what Tyler was doing and, um what i was doing the differences and and then just try to fix that for saturday yeah jeremy a couple questions for you on this so when you how did it all come about and what what were what attracted you to do this ride i mean certainly daytona i know and it's iconic but on this bike and did you have any not prior knowledge about what's been going on with this king of the baggers class i've been watching snippets of it last last couple of years because uh, you all must know Paul Langley. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, good friend of mine. He's been a he's been an avid you know supporter for, for of mine for quite a few years. And he had asked me a couple of years ago, would I be interested in coming and looking at it? Uh, that was start of 2020 or end of night could be an end of 19. But of course, we all know what happened then. You know, travel stopped around about March, and uh, you know, and I wasn't able to go over and test. Never mind race. So, uh, my name had been associated with with riding the Indian, and then 
obviously understandably you know tyler got the ride he's, and he's done a, a, a great job on the bike and then the conversation came back up again would you be able to come and at least test the bike uh but you're going to be testing with another couple of riders and then they're going to make a decision on on what they're going to do so yeah that, that was i was okay with that okay let's let's go and see what what, what it's all about and we did the t we all did the test and uh we started to make some just making some progress with the bike small changes and areas that i that i thought we could we could improve on the bike uh, as a whole is 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 pretty incredible as as you can see it uh, it's uh it doesn't need an awful lot of um of of development because the bike's already uh, very competitive as it is but the the guys in, in the team you know Jeff Bailey and uh you know uh, John John Fox and those guys really had a look and just just put, you know, watched me for a day, watched how we we, we made some development, and uh, then called me back and said, "Would you would you come and race it at Daytona?" And I was a bit surprised, I suppose, because you know you guys have got a lot of very fast riders over there, and uh, you know it, it certainly it certainly woke me up whenever I got the call, "Can you come and race in Daytona?" Because that is, you know, you're jumping at the, at the deep end whenever you haven't really raced the motorcycle, so. Yeah, I convinced myself to do it. A little, little bit of, you know, it's nerve wracking, I suppose. I, I've got to admit, whenever you get a call like that, and then you've got, to, you've got to really switch on and come over and give it your best shot. So, uh, uh, I, it, it, it was an honour to firstly to get the the call. Uh, you know, Dean Young phoned me when I was on the way home, and he said, "Look, uh, well, they've all had a chat. The, the board have had a chat." Gary Gray wants you to come and do this. Um, can you do it? And of course, it didn't take me long to say, "Yeah, of course I'll do it." You know, jump at it with both hands, and 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 the rest is history. You know, so to to get a win on the bike first time out, uh, you know, it just certainly it's it's been really really satisfying for me. You know, personally, it's it's a goal to win any any time you race, but to win at Daytona when there's, there's such a buzz about the place and you get so few opportunities to race a Daytona was, was something very special. You know, it's funny. I was, I was actually laughing in the media center. I wasn't down on pit wall when you first went out, but we had heard that you were actually pounding on the seat and calling for t air pressure or something like this. And it sort of underscored <laughs> the fact that you weren't doing this for fun. And it, it wanted me, it reminded me to invoke the saying that evil Knievel used to say when people would ask him why he did that, he would go, do you know who the hell I am? And I wanted to <laughs> say that, do you know who the hell Jeremy McWilliams is? Of course he wants his tire pressure, right? It was, <laughs> can you tell us what was going on there a little bit? Well, <laughs> yeah, it does look, this is quite funny when you see it on the Insta story. Yeah, you know it's it's when you got so little time, all of our time had been reduced. So I guess I was getting a little bit frustrated that I, that I wasn't really making a lot of progress. And to be really honest, that that was that was my fault. It's my fault for not really learning the track quickly enough. Again, it's, it's little intricacies or you know that Daytona has, which makes you know sets it aside from any other circuit. It's quite it's quite a technical track, even though when you look at the infield section it's pretty straightforward on the infield section but how you get off six and how you get through the bus stop chicane and get off the bus stop chicane and use the banking and in the one is that that those are all the important points on daytona i just wasn't doing it you know i just wasn't doing it properly and uh so i'm getting more frustrated at myself yeah of course i want the right tire pressure because i think i've only got one more lap left to try to put a qualifying lap in. In actual fact, I missed the lap anyway. By the time I rolled out behind, uh, I rolled out behind Kyle Wyman and uh, and thinking, okay, this is perfect on the right place. But then I looked at the clock and the clock was ticking down. We didn't get a, we didn't get through the, the flag before the finish of the session. So I was a bit frustrated. You know, sixth place on the grid. And I thought, wow, that's not really where I want to be. But we'll take it because I got into the shootout. Didn't make the best of the shootout at all finished fifth in it useless really and then uh and then I, I started working it out a little bit better for race one 
got a little bit closer, got two really fast laps at the end of the race. So that kind of gave me a little bit of inspiration that I knew I, I just had it in there. I just hadn't found what what it was that I needed. And, and then, as I said, looking at the data overnight and trying to work the whole thing out because yeah, it, it, it they do take a little bit, their bikes, these, these, these baggers are a little bit different than just jumping on a sports bike and riding the way you, you ride a sports bike. You, you can't really do that because they, they, you know, they're, they don't rev high. They've got a lot of torque. You're on a Daytona tire. The Daytona tire is super safe. As we know, you know, Dunlop have made a tire that's, it's really safe for the banking. So don't have a lot of grip on the left-hand side. And it's just trying to manage all of those points and trying to put, put them all together and make, make it work for the next day. And, yeah, I was getting frustrated, but to be honest, it was probably more of myself. It looks like I'm shouting at the team, but I'm just getting frustrated at myself because I'm not making big headway at the time. And um, I told, uh, before I came out, I'd said to, to Chuck uh, Axland, I said, you know, if, if I come out here, I'm going to have to win one of these races. And he just laughed. He just said, <laughs> what makes you think you can come out here and win a race? I said, well, if it, if, if I do, if I do, will you promise to get Kenny Roberts down to present me the trophy? <laughs> but Chuck mustn't have taken me seriously because he didn't bring Kenny down. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's good. Well, it seems, it seems like the team is going to work well. Uh, for starters, I mean, you're, you're, you're obviously been developing motorcycles for a long time and you're good at it. And Tyler O'Hara is admits that he's not good at it now i know at daytona he helped you a lot with how how to ride that bike well and you helped with your part of making some changes to the bike to get the thing developed and get it going in a little better direction is that is that an accurate assumption yeah but i, I think as ter- tyler as a rider is an, an incredible i mean what he did over the weekend was incredible he you know, he, he knew what he needed to do and he came out and basically just did it. He's leading the, the championship and that's really where, where he needed and where he wanted to be. So he's very, uh, what's the best way to describe Tyler? He, he's totally committed and he's, uh, and he's straight down the line. And it's nice working with him because when we're making progress, we're making it together, you know, I'm sharing information with him and vice versa. And that's, that's really how it worked. You know, I had to use some of his style to, to make the bike work in, in, in race two. And that, that was down to him. And he was using some of what, you know, we were, we, we learned at the test to, to improve. So it's it's a really good, uh, just a, a really good team work together. And we're all after the same thing. And, you know, we, we, what, one thing about, the SNS cycle mission foods Indian is that they are all really, really dedicated in trying to make this, this work. You know, they, they really want to win a championship as do Harley, you know, but I think that both manufacturers drive each other on and, uh, and the team, you know, the team spirit and the, just the, the, the dynamic that we have really works well. So I have to take my hat off to Tyler, you know, he's, he, he really knows how to 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 work with with the team very well and he knows how to ride that bike i don't i reckon that without my help he'd still be doing what what he's doing anyway mm-hmm. okay as far as developing motorcycles is that uh, you're, you're obviously known for that is that something that you've always been good at or is it just is it just amassing a lot of knowledge from riding a lot of different motorcycles over a long period of time um, I think you get a you get a feel for things whenever you've been sort of thrust into development. You start thinking about what what you do and what you like about a motorcycle. If, unless you're working in that line of work, that's not really how you think. You know, you, you get on a motorcycle and you ride it, and some motorcycles you like and some you don't, and some you think that's yeah, a bit uncomfortable, but you're not really sure why it's uncomfortable, uh, or. Or, or, or the power delivery or whatever that might be. And yeah, over the years, it's, it's like anything. And if you do anything long enough, you know, Paul, you just basically learn to do it better. I think everybody improves at what they do if they do it long enough. And 
I've just been doing it long enough now to to know what what works and what doesn't really work. Uh, and I've I've worked with you know for KTM for, for quite a few years, and and that's that's all been it's been in, enjoyable work because it's been on motorcycles that really excite me. Um, you know the the twelve ninety Super Duke, the eight ninety R, the seven ninety. You know the, the GT. I'm working still working on the twelve ninety GT. So so I do everything from suspension you know traditional suspension to semi-active geometry rider ergo um tire tire and wheel choices there's there's a lot to the development side of it so i mean it comes in quite handy when you jump on something else uh you know you can then i I guess turn that you know whatever that skill set is to to helping you know us move forward as a race team and I, i I guess way back when I was working with Kenny Roberts and those guys, you know, I was using it then to try to develop the, the KR3 and when we got pole position and stuff on it and putting it amongst the MotoGP bikes that are the new, the new era four stroke bikes. When they came along, we were still on the two stroke. Uh, just, just basically just trying to develop the bike to, to, to its maximum potential. And um, it's, it's kind of easy to do that whenever you've got such a, a well dedicated team around you that are quite willing to change whatever you need on that motorcycle to to improve now with your work with ktm and you develop obviously a lot of street bike stuff for them is does do you find that like making something work on the racetrack makes it a better street bike or does sometimes can you go down a rabbit hole by trying to make a race bike and that's not how the most that's not how the public's going to use it well, you don't. Street bikes are made for the street, you know, and we do all of our testing on the street. So we do it, or we do it in in proving grounds, you know, private proving grounds, uh, depending on on how new the motorcycle is, you know, at, at what stage it's in and the prototype stage. So, so it starts as a P zero, which is a prototype, the, the very very first. There, there is only one of them, and then you it moves on to P one, P two, and pre P three is is pre production, obviously, but the you you make the bike work on the road first and then what we do is we we then produce aftermarket suspension and what not to that, that that then will help it if somebody wants to take that street bike onto the onto the track and then we of course we develop that aftermarket those aftermarket parts on the racetrack um but of course the aftermarket parts also need to work on the road because you know you can buy a motorcycle put in aftermarket suspension take it to the track or, or ride home again from the track on the road so it has to you know we we, we come up with the settings that, that that basically enable the rider to use it in every different scenario now the the deal with indian does that has that does that affect your ktm relationship are you still doing that for ktm or is that gone no i'm still working for ktm back out to italy on monday to do some some tire uh, tire and wheel testing, um, and I, that you know I've got a long term contract with KTM, and uh, that's not affected by by any of my racing um, antics. You know that's that's just that's something on the side. We as test riders, there's about there's about five test riders in our department, and we all race uh, in different ways. You know, some uh, ones a supermoto, ones a, the German supermoto champion currently. Um, yeah, and you know, you've got uh, a couple of riders, Thomas Gradinger. I don't know if you, have, you know any of the, the American people. You know, they're listening to this. Will will know who he is. He's he's a big enough name over here in Europe, and he races in in IDM. As does Luca Grunvold, who, who works with us as well. He's also racing in IDM, so he's racing something else as well. He's racing, you know, a, a Yamaha and uh, different manufacturers as well. That doesn't impact on their KTM work. You know, what we're what we're all doing with KTM is it stays within the KTM family, and then and that and we we just we all get on and do that together, work together uh, very very well, um, and yeah, anything outside if we have to go racing doesn't impact on that. Thankfully, that works well. Yeah, man, Jeremy, I got to tell you, I'm absolutely chomping at the bit here. I got a million questions to ask you. <laughs> so- Sean, I'll let you go for a while. I'll shut up. 
Thanks. No, it's okay. It's okay. But but one of the things that Paul, I, I didn't understand, I guess I'm because of Daytona and you can clarify this maybe for me alone, if not for some of the, the listeners, I thought you were doing this ride as a one-off at Daytona, but are you actually racing the entire season at King of the Baggers for us? Um, next out at Atlanta, we, we've got some little bits and pieces to, to check before that. And then, uh, we want to be in, well, we'll definitely be in Atlanta. I know Atlanta. I love the track too. I've been before when I raced uh, many years ago in AMA. So I, I know my way around that. Again, you know, you got to relearn it when it's been so many years, but Atlanta and then for sure Laguna Seca. Um, not sure if I'll make uh, Road America yet. I'd like to, but um, it just depends on really on uh, on the team you know I've, I've got to leave that that decision up to them and I suppose it gets it's it really comes down to how I get on at Atlanta you know if I, if I go to Atlanta and and don't do so well I can you know or don't split the you know the Harleys or work for the team whatever they might need from me then of course uh, I might not be back at the Road Atlanta or Road America one but looking forward to Atlanta and I love Laguna Seca yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, if you continue to win, there, I mean, there's no question they're probably going to keep you going if you can do it. But the other thing I want to ask you about is you mentioned KTM. So were you paying attention to the hooligan race? They only got one race in because of the weather. But obviously, a KTM won it with Andy Debrino. And did it tempt you? Could you possibly race in Super Hooligan on a KTM? Yeah, of course. I would love to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I developed that bike. You know that that that's it's nice to see it winning there. So I, I put quite a bit of time and an effort into the development side of that bike. So it's lovely to see it doing so well there. And that's that that's a great class to watch. You know, it's it's one again. I'm not I'm not going to miss it when I'm next back. I'd love to race in it, but I guess you know my priorities at the moment are uh, you know are with Indian and and doing what we need to do with them. But yeah, but I, I'm always open to offers. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'm. Um, I would love the risk uh, in the hooligan class as well. So this is funny. We, we talk a lot about uh, Michael Barnes, who occasionally is still racing with us. And, you know, we always, we always invoke Michael Barnes's name as a person who's raced pretty much every motorcycle and has been around for a while and will race anything anywhere. But you are certainly, uh, you're, you're kind of the Michael Barnes of globally, I would say. And I know you know Barney pretty well, I'm sure. Yeah, I know Barney quite well. I'm, I'm sure Barney's even older than me, right? No. Oh yeah! No, no, he's not. He's I thought not. He was. <laughs> Sean, Sean and I and Wayne Rainey are the only ones older than you in our paddock. All right, yeah. <laughs> but, but I will point. Something, I will point something out, Jeremy. People keep saying that you're 58, and I know you're only 57 because your birthday is April 4th. It's the same day as my older brother, and the same day as Josh Hayes, who considers himself. An old man, but uh, you guys were both born on April the 4th. So you're going right. to be 58 then. You're not 58 now. You're still a young man. No, I've, I've, I've a while to go before I'm 58. Yeah, at least three <laughs> reps. <laughs> exactly. So, so I'm going to I'm going to take this one away from Paul Carruthers because he rightfully should be talking about this, Paul, uh, Jeremy, since Paul's dad is Kel and worked with Kenny Roberts. But we have to talk about Kenny Roberts. I mean, you you for for some of the listeners that may not realize this about you. I mean, you you raced for that team um, on their prototype motorcycle developed by Kenny and his people in Banbury in England. But you also took a pole position in the 2002 Australian GP on a Proton KR bike. And I can't remember if it's the V3 or the V5, but, but can you tell us about the time period that you were with Kenny? And really, how did you get, how did he get in touch with you? I mean, you obviously developed the heck out of that bike and, you know, Junior was involved in it as well and some other riders. But uh, talk to us about those, those days with Kenny. Well, I'd love to tell you everything, but you'd have to censor it. <laughs> <With Kenny's Right. laughs> like, I, I mean, I had some great times with Kenny. It was a great team to work with. He was, uh, you, you know, Kenny, he's, he's a laugh and he's great to work with. Uh, he's very, very, um, very dedicated too, to, to, you know, making, a, in those days, making a great race team and the team worked very, very well together. Chuck was part of it as well. Chuck actually was part of the yeah. team. He managed it at the time. So uh, I, it came about because I was riding an Aprilia in 2001, uh, 250. 
and I had a win then and at the end of the year I met up with Kenny and you know he said you really should be riding my bike you know you should have been here a year or so ago we were going to approach you but you had an offer from Aprilia in 2000 and you took that offer he said that was probably the year that you should have been here anyway long story short I got a contract with him for 2002 and 2003 and uh, it was just it was during his development period with the, the, that V3, uh, two, yeah, two stroke, and then they moved on to V5. It was a John Bernard uh, designed four stroke, which never really came to much. But the V3, the two stroke V3, was an awesome piece of kit. It really was. I mean, it, maybe it, it only made 165, 175 horsepower. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, you know, it's it. it it was able to really, I, I'd say it was the nicest motorcycle I've, I've ever ridden. I, I keep saying that because it was the easiest motorcycle I ever, ever rode. The power delivery was perfect. And, and it was light, I, you know, it was 120 kilograms or something, you know, what's that in pounds, probably 200 and 230 or 240 pounds or something, whatever it was. Easy. So it's not wow. it was really, really, really light. And, uh, just, a, just an awesome piece of kit. And, uh, you know, I, I got the chance to to, to ride with, with them. And w- unfortunately, we were always a little bit on the back foot compared to the, the V4 uh, two-stroke, you know, the, the, the full factory bikes. We were always just a little bit behind them. But, it's you know, it still holds the fastest lap ever around uh, around Phillip Island and also Saxon Ring and I think Rio, some other tracks, it still has the fastest two-stroke lap record. So bike was there it was just probably we probably just got to the to its you know the pinnacle of its development just a little bit too late and it was just at the same time whenever uh motor gp was moving over to to the four stroke era that's 264 pounds so um 600 wow. pounds less than his bike he won daytona on right <laughs> that's quite a, <laughs> it's quite a bit <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and Chuck told us this. So Chuck, Chuck's uh, willing to admit this if Kenny isn't. So tell us this. I started to ask you this, Jeremy, in our hospitality, but I, uh, I was rushed for time and didn't get a chance to talk to you. But you got to tell us, you, you, one of those KR bikes caught on fire when you were on it, didn't it? Uh, Chuck claims that anyway. He thought well, it, that, Chuck, was, yeah. that wasn't me. I, I reckon that was... Jimmy Whittem. At, at, okay. okay. When he, he when he burned it to a crisp in Bruno in Czech Republic, I'm sure that was Jimmy Whittem. I, I know he he completely annihilated a, a, a bike. I think it was because he he dropped it. He dropped it and it just it blew up. Basically, it just it it, it fired fuel everywhere and it just went up in a ball of smoke. Um, there's a, there's a few bikes went on fire back there and I wasn't really on. I can't remember being on one of them. Uh. The V5 did did catch light a few times because of an oil uh, seepage problem that we had on the carbon the, 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 the carbon fiber engine cases that they were using, and uh, we did have some problems with the V5. Uh, the Aprilia, I remember the Aprilia going up in smoke. It yeah, the Cube, year, Colin Edwards. Yeah, cube. Yep. It went up in smoke, but that was Colin Edwards. Yeah. Uh, yep. And then I rode that. I rode that bike the year after Colin. Oh wow! Okay. Wow, and I remember that was two thousand and four, and I remember, I remember saying to Colin at the time, "Why didn't you tell me it was this bad?" And he, and he said, "Well, you never, you never ask." <laughs> <laughs> it no, was, it, that was a hard bike it, to ride. Out. It was, it was <laughs> that Chuck mentioned, and and that's why I got confused about when you raced and you you took pole on the two stroke V three. I got confused on that but yeah it must have been he must have been thinking of that v5 when you were testing it or something like that but how far were you so this forgive my my knowledge of geography but that you guys the shop was in i think it was in bainbury right and and since you're how far is that from where you live i mean is it a well, ways yeah that's in mainland england so right it's a, it, it's a short flight you know it's a 45 minute flight over uh that they they were their place was sort of in the center of, of where all of those, uh, that, that mechanical engineering was go- ongoing in Formula One and everything, you know, Oxford and Banbury and that whole area. It was quite near Silverstone Racetrack. And, uh, you yeah, know, I would visit, visit just the, I suppose every other 
couple month or whatever, I would I would call over and see how they're getting on. They had a, quite a, a an extensive workshop in the middle of Banbury. And then I, I need to talk about another another brand that man. I'll tell you, I only associated it with with uh, the Indy Five Hundred. You worked you worked with the Ilmore team. Uh, tell us about that a little bit. That that's a whole other thing that was incredible for you. Yeah, I, I've worked with quite a few things. I, I mean, I've worked on another project as well in the in the interim uh a bmw oral was just called oral engineering and it was italian based and they were trying to produce a, a moto gp bike also and it was using the same sort of configuration as the aprilia cube three cylinders off a formula one car um with very very little crankshaft inertia in, you know in it. it it never really got any further than, than the, the the test year that we that we tested it then and uh, 2007, Ilmore approached me and asked me would I come and race with uh, with them in uh, in MotoGP. And that, unfortunately, again, that 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 got off to an okay start. That was the beginning of the 800 CC era, and uh, so they were one of the first to make the 800 CC motorcycle. And then, of course, I think we got as far as Doha did one round and then the team pulled out with lack of sponsorship. Uh, Mario Alien was a great, uh, I, I'm sure you know him, but you know, he, he produces their, their company produces most of your NASCAR engines and Indy engines. Yes. Uh, they're built, they're all built in Oxford at, at the, at Mario Williams place at the Elmore plant. And the, you know, they got into two wheels briefly to see how they, they might, you know, use some of their, their Formula One technology uh, to bring into MotoGP. And it was very impressive. The bike was really impressive, really small, um, uh, producing kind of the right sort of power to begin with. We were maybe, I think we got it within a second of, of the of the big manufacturers by the end of, end of that year. So they still tested it a little bit, even though they stopped racing it after the first round. And that, I think that purely was only because of, uh, of financial um, constraints on not not you know finding the sponsorship that they needed to run the team. Yeah, and I mean just for the fans that don't know, Ilmore is a, a blend of uh, Jeremy mentioned Mario Ilian, but also Paul Morgan. So they took the ill part of Ilian and the more part of Morgan's last name and put it together to form Ilmore. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's British it. British and in Northamptonshire. So speaking of British a little bit and uh, the United Kingdom, I have a. I have this question for you, Jeremy, man, I have wanted to know this forever. And Paul, Paul might already know it being that he's from Australia, but what is the deal? Oh, well, first of all, I got to tell you the other day, somebody got, got yelled at us because we call it road racing here in the U S because he said pro road racing is, is on roads. And I'm like, well, you guys call it aluminium. So what, what you know, we don't call it that either. So <laughs> it's like whatever, but this is the thing I need to understand. Okay. Barry Sheen, um, Gary McCoy, you, so several others. Okay, Barry was Baza. You were Je you're Jezza. Uh, yeah. Gary was Gaza, and there's a bunch Gaza. of. How does that happen? What is that? <laughs> I I think Paul Point knows that better because Australians are well known for for shortening and making <laughs> yeah you know, real. They 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 shorten everything. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, you're going to the the one I always would laugh at was Bottolo. Bottolo is a, is a, is a place where you buy beer, a bottle shop. <laughs> so, so yeah, I guess we all get it's maybe it's a more European thing, but you know, Barry, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Baz, it's an easier easier than Barry. It just or Baz. I get Jez because it's short for Jeremy or Jezza. Uh, Gaz is a shortened name, and you know, for Gary or Gaza. Don't you do that in America? Not really. And and then they you'll notice sometimes they'll add a Y on it. Sean, I call you Shawnee sometimes. I don't know why. Hey, you do. I love it actually. My my mom calls me that, so I love it when you do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's messed up. So, Jeremy, did you? Uh, oh wait, Sean, I I got a tip from Chuck Axel, and he said that there's a talent that Jeremy has that not many people know about. Oh. And it, it's a it's his ability to be the last person to board a flight but not miss <laughs> but not miss it <laughs> that's true he, he said he didn't understand he's like i get on the plane 
and he's nowhere to be seen and he's out shopping or he's doing something and the last second he walks on the plane every single time is that just something you enjoy yeah because the plane can't leave without you you know when your when your luggage is on it can't really go without you so uh, <laughs> we usually wait until our name gets called but the, the reason for doing that is because if you haven't bought yourself a premium seat you can always sit somewhere near the front if you go, if you're last man on right yeah <laughs> so you sure you're not scottish <laughs> <laughs> not just a chuck wouldn't buy me premium seats so i just had to, had to wait until last minute and then get on and sit where i wanted yeah we, we do it here we do it here in europe a lot because uh the, the the problem that we have when we get off is, is passport control so the closer you can get to the front of the plane the quicker you can get through passport control so that's really the main reason that's my excuse anyway well, that's funny because I remember, I don't know, it might have been going to Australia or something or somewhere. I was on an international flight and Neil McKenzie, who is Scottish, was in first <laughs> class and his wife, Jan, was in the back of the plane, which I thought was pretty interesting. because That happened all the time with Neil. That, uh, honestly, that's, that's true. Whenever he was racing, he was always up the front. And Jan was always down the back. Yeah. Well, I could never get my head around that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he could get away with it good on him, but I don't know how many of us could. No, not, a, not many of us. What? Have you, you've never raced the TT, right? No, never. No, I just didn't have time to go and learn it. Everybody's asked me why I didn't ever do it. It's only because I never got a chance to really go and spend the time that it needs to, to learn the track. You know, it's, it's 37 miles long. You know, you're not going to learn it in a day. Uh, it's going to take a number of years to learn it. You know, it's going to right. take quite a number of, of visits to learn it. And I just don't really, I never thought I would have the time to go and do that. A good friend of mine, uh, Glenn Irwin, is doing it this year as a, as a newcomer. Mm -hmm. And he's had, to, he's had to go back and forward quite a few times now. You spend a lot of time on the island. And I don't know if you've ever been to the Isle of Man, but... Hope nobody, nobody from the Isle of Man's listening, but it's not the sort of place you want to spend much time at. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I always liked it when I was a kid. My birthday was usually there. So right. you're actually in a country where they spoke English. And, you know, there was a go-kart <laughs> track and things like that. It was a pretty cool place to be as a, as a kid. But, yeah, you're... Yeah, as a kid. Yeah, as a kid, it's great. But it, 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 it is like the land that time's forgotten, hasn't it? I mean, it looks <laughs> like it's, it's been left in the 60s. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was always amazed. Isn't it? Wasn't it true, or isn't it still true? Doesn't Neil Hodgson live on the Isle of Man? I don't know how he does it. <laughs> no, he he did. Uh, he, he he did when he was racing. He's not living there now. But a, a lot of riders did, you know, for taxation. I suppose you know, just for tax purposes because you pay less less tax on it. But I'd prefer to pay more tax and live somewhere where I want to live. So they've all come <laughs> back over here. So you, you know. <laughs> Johnny Ray was was on it. He's now back uh, living just down the road from from me because he's originally from right beside where I live. Yeah. And uh, I'll, actually, Cal Crutchlow's living here too. Um, he oh, so was, Cal uh, not on the Isle of Man anymore? No, no. Huh. I, I, I don't. That, he might. He's going between the two at the moment. But the problem was that uh, during the you know the pandemic, he wasn't able to go back and forward there. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they they really shut down they closed up completely and of course as a test rider he needed to commute right speaking of that test rider job i mean if you were if you if this was 20 years ago and things were the same that would have been a perfect job for you don't you think yeah it's perfect i mean honestly i've got no complaints about my my job at the moment i've i don't know how many more years i can carry on doing it but uh i think i've got the perfect job I, th right. I think I've, I've got the perfect balance. Um, I work about 100, 110 days a year on, on you know, with, with KTM, whether, wherever that might be, it could be anywhere in the world, but that's what the contract is. So I've still got quite a bit of time to myself and time to do other things. And that's really how the, I was able to fit in the bagger, uh, the king of the baggers to, in between my, my work. Okay, I've got a quick question, and then we can kind of get this thing wrapped up if we if we can get Sean off the. Off the I have call. one more after you, Paul. Just real All quick. right. So yeah. obviously you're going to Road Atlanta. Yeah. You rode the you rode the you rode the baggers at Daytona for the first time, or raced it for the first time. How much different is it going to be racing that bagger at a track like Road Atlanta as opposed to Daytona? A bit more physical. Uh, um, you know, it's definitely there's a bit more work on 
change of direction and stuff. A lot of it really is, you know, it's up, it's up to us to, to make the bike as best as we can for Atlanta, try to make it, um, you know, super agile while it's not losing any of stability for, for that track. And, and yeah, and I, and, you know, I'm, I know that I'm going to, you know, have to work, you know, put a bit of work into my own physicality too. I need to, you know, it's definitely when you're pulling a big bagger around, it does take a little bit of effort. So I think it's going to be fun because the, these baggers work way better than anybody would have ever believed they do. Whenever you get on one, I think you're, comp I was completely surprised just how good they are, um, how much fun they are to ride and uh, how much grip they, 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 they make as well out of, out of the turn. So I, I think I'm just looking forward to it, you know, bring it on and hopefully we get enough time. There's no, you know, we don't have any reduced um, sessions like we did at Daytona. That kind of hurt for a little bit, but got there in the end. All right. Two, I've got two more, Sean, but they're quick. Okay. okay. First, uh, you, you, re, you got to ride alongside the Harley, obviously, at Daytona. So I'm interested to see what you think uh, the differences are, if any, or how well balanced the two bikes are. And the second one is, I can't remember, but I'll remember after you answer the first <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. Well, the Harley, I mean, Harley have done a great job. You, you can't take that away from them. They're the current, you know, reigning champions. And they do, they do tend to, to have a little bit of a jump on us just on the exit of the corner. Uh, they, they seem extra strong. They seem super strong there. They have the, 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 their chassis dialed in really well. Um, you know, you, I, I, I need to get closer to the Harleys, to be honest, <laughs> to see just how good the, the top two Harleys are, you know, Travis and Kyle. And looking forward to hopefully, you know, getting a, a close run with them in Atlanta, but they, the, the bikes look really, all of the bikes look great. And particularly, you know, the, the Harley works very well. And when it gets off the corner, it kind of jumps me a little bit out of the corner. That's where I struggle a little bit against it. But that part of that's me and, and how I, you know, how I adapt to the, to the Indian. All right. My last one. And I think people would be surprised based on that, what those motorcycles are based on, but is your, uh, you're not able to get your feet on the ground on that when you're st standing still, are you? No, not really, no, because you, you do have to jack them up, of course, or we're not going to have the ground clearance. Right. Um, that's it. That's the only reason why they're they're a little bit higher. Uh, I I dropped mine a little bit at Daytona until I started to touch out, and then we had to lift it a little bit more again. So, so it's the, the just it's fine. I'm trying to find a happy medium that, <clears throat> you know, the taller motorcycle is a little bit more difficult to, you know, there's there's a little bit more pitch and stuff with it when it's when it's higher, but. Yeah, you know, we we basically just contract that with with suspension settings and you know and trying to just, just just basically just adapt into the slightly higher bike. It actually, doesn't make it, it does it doesn't feel when you're on the bike and running. It's only whenever you take off, right? You, you know, you, when you're standing up still with it. Once you get once once you roll out of pits, it feels totally natural. Yeah, Kyle Wyman told me the scariest part is actually maneuvering around in the pit. That's it. That that's where you know you know you've got to you've got a big motorcycle and, uh, and it's, and you, you're a small rider, like, like I am. So you're, right. you, there's no way I could put tippy toes on both feet on. I've, I've got to touch with one foot. Oh, you Sean. <laughs> okay. Two real quick ones, Jeremy. So I'm not going to ask you, you've ridden so many motorcycles, raced so many motorcycles, different brands, all kinds of motorcycles. I'm not going to ask you to name your favorite brand of race bike you ever <laughs> rode, but I am going to ask you if you, and, and I'm talking pure race bikes, Two-stroke or four-stroke? A hundred percent two-stroke. They yeah, were, maybe. they were the bikes. I mean, they still are. Anytime you get to hear two-stroke, it doesn't it just bring the greatest memories back. And yeah. we wonder, wonder. I keep wondering why they stopped. Now, had they developed or continued to develop the two-stroke right now, they'd be going quicker than the current MotoGP bikes. Yeah, I wish they'd come back. I still the smell. Oh my gosh, it's just the greatest yeah. thing. Okay, I'm, here's I'm a very. You. Here's a very bizarre question, but I have wanted to ask you this for a long, long time. Has anybody ever told you that you kind of look a little like a younger Bob Dylan? Yeah, I get that a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, uh, well, younger, I, I'm, I'm glad you said younger now. I'd like to, I'd like to think I'm younger than him. But yeah, I, I did get that a while, a while ago. Yeah. That's uh, good. 
<laughs> so I, so I, I, I changed my, my hair, didn't I? I stopped running around with the curly locks, as I did when I was a bit younger. <laughs> got, got a short haircut. <laughs> All right, Sean. All um, right. Um, let's, let's let him go. Um, Jeremy, I appreciate you joining us. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, as I knew it would be, and, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at Road Atlanta. Yeah, thanks, guys. Looking forward to it. Can't wait to get out again. All right, mate. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. All right. All thanks right. for the chat. All right, take care. See you guys.